Hey there, everybody. Welcome to session two of uh, running a newsletter with Ghost. Um, we're gonna. Um, I'm here with Pilot. Um, and uh, if you don't know Pilot, Pilot, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Pilot. I am the uh, hosting account manager at Reclaim, um, which means I do a lot of different things. I send a lot of emails. I talk to a lot of people. Uh, I work with both the sales and the ed tech teams and one of the things that I'm responsible for is compiling our monthly newsletter, which is the Reclaim Roundup. We run it in Ghost. Um, so I am in charge of collecting all of the items that we want to put there and uh, putting them in order, organizing them, and writing them up, um, giving that sort of cohesive tone, and just generally making it something that we can send out into the world on the end of the month. Uh, I guess I'm going to date this video we are recording right at the tail end of October. So we are in the process of compiling the October roundup, which will go out on Monday, the 31st. Uh, and so we're probably gonna be, I'm gonna, I've been thinking a lot about the process for how we put this together, both for this um, workshop and for this flex course and for, I've been trying to write some internal documentation so it doesn't all live in my head. And so this has just been a really good opportunity for me to examine what this actually means, what putting this together does. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Um, the uh, I, I'm 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 betting this will be our spookiest roundup at yet, um, <laughs> and it'll be great. And it comes out on the official first day of this workshop, which is cool. Oh, too. cool. Um, the uh, um, so yeah, we're we're gonna dig into during this session. Um, all of the, we're going to dig into the ghost interface. We're going to be doing stuff in ghost in the dashboard. Um, we've already set up our ghost uh, install last week. Um, so um, I uh, last time uh, demoed that. Um, so we'll kind of leave, pick up where we left off, where if you've been following along, you should have a ghost site. If you want to follow along for this session, you don't have to have anything in the ghost site other than you should be able to log in. Um, the uh, um, I made a new one actually for this week because I showed my database credentials last time. So, uh, <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> um, and then I don't, you know, not a great thing to put on a public video. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're going to be working with my little uh, dummy site newsletter.jaden.me, and we'll also show um, some stuff in the roundup. Uh, roundup. But where do you want to start? Yeah. Um... I mean, so there's a bunch of different places that we can start. Uh, I would say that I have things sort of outlined by uh, the beats that I want to hit. Um, so I think maybe the first place to look at would just be the front page of the Roundup, if you have that open. And we can take a look at that. Um, because that just seems like a good place to start, which is thinking about uh, what you want to be doing um, with your newsletter. So just thinking through what we wanted to accomplish with the Roundup, this actually got started as an idea at our 2021 team retreat where we were thinking, hey, there's a lot of stuff that we do behind the scenes that we want to make more known to, um, to our customers, to the schools that we work with. We want to make sure that people are able to see what resources are available to them, what research we're doing, the blogging, the projects, things that are happening behind the scenes that they're maybe not aware of. Uh, it's also a really good way to get announcements out because you want to have a way for people to know what's happening. That's kind of important. Um, so that was what we were thinking about for the Roundup. That was uh, defining what our objectives were and defining our topic. So the topic is reclaim. What's the work that we're doing? And the objective is getting the word out, basically, letting people know. Um, you can do, so I would say that that's probably the first and most important thing that you want to be doing when you are making your newsletter is knowing what you're going for. Um, and all of my examples today are gonna be grounded in the Roundup because that's the newsletter that I make. That's what we do here. Um, but there are going to be some resources for this week that talk about uh, different modes. We'll get into modes and what you might want to be talking about 
this is just sort of the starting place for it all. Topic. What do you want to talk about? How do you want to talk about it? What's your focus? Um, so then we're just working through it. Uh, planning. It's This is again the part of this is a really personal choice and that makes it sound super difficult and oh gosh this is so personal but the main thing is that you want to be running something that you enjoy making if you are making something that you hate making you will stop making it or you will be miserable and then yeah. you know you'll stop eventually and i imagine that that has a lot to do with sort of topic selection what you're going to write about but also pace, uh, you yeah. know, when, when are you writing? How often does it come out? Things like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that's actually a really good dovetail into one of the things that I want to talk about, which is we put out the uh, Roundup monthly. Um, there are some newsletters that go out weekly, daily, daily, oh my God, uh, bi-weekly, um, there are other forms of sort of serialized like podcasts come out on various schedules. Uh, and the important thing there is to pick a schedule that you can manage. Um, so the roundup works for us. It comes out once a month, which that's a great period of time for us to collect work. Uh, if we put out all the work that we do over the course of a week, it's going to be kind of flimsy and you're going to be getting a lot of emails from us as opposed to one nice solid email per month. Um, this is also important because we can't build up a backlog. Uh, there are, if, if you are doing, I'm publishing this every week, every two weeks, you may want to build up a backlog of things so that you, I don't know, if you hit, gosh, what's coming up that might impact your schedule, the holiday season? What, maybe you have to travel? That way that if something happens, you end up with a backlog, you can continue to put things out pretty regularly. Um, regular, I feel so strange saying this because part of my philosophy is like, you know, this can be for fun. You can be doing it for you. Uh, also the things that I know about marketing and communications are if you put things out regularly, that's how you sustain an audience because they know what to expect and when to expect it. So totally. uh, that's maybe also one of the things that separates a newsletter from a blog is putting it out really consistently. Sure. Um, so do you have a question? Um, n not really. I mean, I think um, one of the things that um, is interesting to me and it's, it's, it's maybe tangential, but um, like the the consistent schedule too. I think you hear people talk about that a lot in um, reference as well to um, like I think that's generally good advice, right? But um, you also hear a lot a lot in reference to like al algorithmic content, which of course this isn't, right? So yeah. you, people are subscribing and it gets emailed to them, or maybe they're subscribed in an RSS feed um, or something like that. Um, whereas a lot of times you hear like. YouTube content creators talk a lot about that because they'll be like, ah, yes, the algorithm wants me to post at least once or twice a week or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is kind of, to me, uh, one of the refreshing things about blogging or newsletter creation at all is a, I mean, you know, depending on what you're doing, you may not care <laughs> if, if there's not like I blog for me, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but uh, newsletters, typically you have an audience in mind. And I think consistency is really kind of the, the consistency and making it manageable is really the main thing that matters, right? Like you, you don't have to worry about like, ah, if we do it, you know, if we do it once a month, the email algorithm isn't going to like it. No, nope, not really a worry. I mean, you probably don't want to do it too often and <laughs> to make it, uh, you burn out on writing it. And maybe you don't want email inbox fatigue for the people subscribed if you're doing yeah. it super often, but um, it's kind of refreshing, right? It is mm -hmm. really more about how you are interacting with it than anything else. Yeah. And that's also thinking about sort of the length of what you want to be putting out um, and the amount of work that you want to, 
you want to be doing for each installation, addition, whatever you want to call it. So the roundup, anecdotally, uh, also this number has changed because we keep adding sections because we keep finding out that we have more to say, but the roundup generally clocks in at between like 1,700 and 2,200 words, um, which is not that short. Um, and that's partially just because I, I like to go on and on and on and because we keep adding stuff, but also it's monthly. So it's a collection of a sizable amount of stuff that's happened over the past month. Whereas if I was putting 1700 words into your inbox every week or twice a week, I think that people would become a lot less likely to read those emails. Yeah. Um, and also it would be hell. I would hate writing that so often I would have to, I generally devote the last four to five days of the month to putting the roundup together. Um, and this works because I can say, all right, that last week, that last four to five days, I know that I'm going to need to put aside a good chunk of my time. So I can do a bunch of stuff earlier. I can postpone stuff if it has to happen, but not for a little while. If I had to do that every single week, that would be unsustainable for me given everything else that I need to do. Well, so. and and in generally, I mean, as well, it, it helps that the way our team works here, we kind of all know, well, Pilot's in roundup mode right now, yeah. you know? <laughs> Not that I don't ever ask you questions or anything like that, of course, mm -hmm. but um, it happens. But, but I think um, it, it, when you say dedicate the time, that that is what it looks like from me, from an outside perspective. It's like, yeah, no, like um, it, we're gonna try to avoid having too many too many things stack up at that point. Otherwise, the roundup's not gonna be manageable. And uh, just <laughs> keeping in mind that writing is long, <laughs> at least for for me, and I, I think most people, it takes a long time. <laughs> you need you need to dedicate that time. Yeah, it's not just gonna happen. Yeah. And one of the other things about that is also workload. Um, so I'm responsible for the roundup at the end of the month, but we also have a mid-month email that's, I think, mostly just announcements. And Amanda handles that and she does a great job, but that also takes a lot of the pressure off of me because if you're putting out the announcements once a month, then you better hope to God people read those. But if you're putting them out tw twice a month, people are much more likely to just see that. It's not as big of a deal. Um, so Amanda's doing a really great job with the mid-month email and splitting those responsibilities means less strain on both of us because we don't have to handle all of the burden of email communications that we put out every month. Um, I want to very quickly touch on mode, uh, which is a thing that I started thinking about uh, as a result of an article that I actually read published by Ghost, which is six types of newsletters you can start today. Uh, that'll be in our weekly resources. Um, uh, it's It basically covers really quickly six types of newsletters that you might want to do. And the idea is the topic that you pick, um, oh, thanks for pulling that up, Taylor. Uh, you can pick a topic and a mode. And so they are not the same thing. So the six types really quickly that they go through are reporting. So general journalistic reporting, analysis, which is generally like reporting, but it's more te technical, academical, research oriented, curation. Uh, that's probably closest to what the roundup is. The roundup is a collection of things. You just collect things and you put them all together. And they talk about tastemakers and influencers who make sure that they're picking out the best stuff. The roundup is a curation email. You don't have to be an influencer to make a curation email or a newsletter. Artistic, which is probably the closest to a personal blog. That's your own reflections, creative works, your personal takes. And practical, tutorials, how-tos, recipe blogs would fit into that category. And then a hybrid, which is a cop-out because that's just a mix of any of the previous five. Uh, but then they give the example of you could do a... If your topic is baking, your mode could be any of these. You could report on 
major baking news that exists. You could do chemical reason. I they have a list <laughs> that I don't. It's boring for me to just read the list, and I don't have it memorized. But the point is that you can write poems about bread. You can give your recipe blog tutorials. You can curate recipes that other people have put out, and that. The mode that you pick and the topic that you choose are not the same thing. So for us, our topic is the work that we do at Reclaim. And our mode is curation, because those fit together really well for what we wanted to do, which was make sure everybody knows about all of the things that we do. Well, and it, it affects greatly a lot of things, right? It, it affects yeah. not only um, how you put together the newsletter, like what you're doing to curate, obviously, mm -hmm. like if it's not a curation, you're maybe sitting down and being like, I'm going to write my one piece for the artistic, you know, cause I'm doing an artistic one, um, but you're curating. So it's, it's pulling in things and then writing about them. But also, I think it also probably affects the tone in which you write too. Like 100%. The ten, it seems like the roundup, like we know that you write it, but it, it doesn't really come off as like first person, pilot talking through an email, right? It, it comes off as reclaim hosting with some personality. Yeah. But not necessarily an individual personality. Yeah. And I mean, that tone, you're absolutely right. That tone sort of comes out of the mode that you pick and what you want to accomplish. So uh, a analysis newsletter is probably going to be very, really quite formal considering that it's dedicated to that sort of technical academic language, a uh, journalistic reporting newsletter is maybe going to sort of straddle that line of like, this is professional, but this is not maybe inaccessible. Um, we want to make sure that it's easy for people to get into. Um, the roundup, we try and keep, yeah, pretty casual, pretty informal, pretty friendly because we want this to be a peek behind the curtain is basically the concept to see what it is that we do behind the scenes and behind the scenes. And here's an extremely formal dressed up version of all the things that we're doing are kind of not, they don't mesh. It's not a great mix. Um, so instead we go for that, as you were saying, reclaim hosting with a bit of personality informal we put in these fun gifts we have little captions um it's not strictly first person but i don't usually try and stick to very solid third person i use a lot of the royal we if you go through it sure um so it's reclaim hostings first person basically um and thinking about that tone will also inform a lot of the Knowing what tone you want to go for is also going to make your writing easier and it's going to make your revising a lot easier because if you know what you're going for the first time around, then when you go through, you will have fewer problems with tone inconsistency where you say, oh, this was actually not what I'm going for. I have to go back and change this whole thing. Yeah. Um, we I want to make sure we're getting through everything, but those are sort of the first couple of things that I would think about before starting to get into the more technical aspects of putting together the newsletter, which is, I think, Taylor, we were going to go behind the scenes and sort of get into the ghost interface a little bit more. Um, but having put that thought into what you want to be writing and how you want to be writing it and all of that, then you can start to look at ghost as a tool and what you're doing there. Um, so I actually want to talk about design first because a lot of the rest of the stuff will sort of roll together. Um, and I'm, I'm picturing like Indiana Jones uh, rolling uh, boulder kind of rolling together. Um, so talking about design first will mostly mean thinking about themes. Um, so ghost actually, this is the ghost dashboard. Um, it's pretty clear, easy to navigate. Jim calls it, I think elegant. Is yeah. this word for it? I do want to remind people too that if you haven't logged in since last week, newsletter, whatever your ghost domain name that you've mapped, mm -hmm. it's going to be slash ghost at the end. Unlike uh, WordPress where it's slash admin, this is slash ghost. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Uh, and so this takes you to your dashboard. Um, it is that sort of more streamlined than WordPress, but you still have that left-hand menu. You have the dashboard, you have your posts area, you have your pages area. Taylor has recently informed me that that's new. That's not something that Ghost used to have. Ghost supports pages now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it did for a long time, but for a long time when you wanted to make a page, you would go make a post, manually set the URL, and then there was a checkbox that says, this is a page. <laughs> and that yeah. just excluded it from the RSS feed and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, um, they now have broken it out into its own pages tab. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if we can just hop into uh, the themes checker, which is, yeah, in that gear menu takes you to customization and then up to design. So you customize your site and you manage themes. And this just shows what it would look like up front. Uh, this is the default ghost theme. I think it might just be called ghost. Uh, but if we... It's called change... Casper. Right. Okay. Yes. So I... I it's get a friendly the joke. ghost. It's yeah. a friendly ghost. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so Ghost has uh, its own theme uh, browser, basically, which is what we're looking at now. They also have options for you to upload your own customized themes. Um, and the themes are also sort of tagged, I guess, with what they are oriented towards. So magazine, podcast, blog, newsletter. I believe the theme that we use is called Digest. Uh, there's, oh, photography, documentation. So if you wanted to run your docs through here. Um, yeah, so that's Digest right uh, in the middle. Yep. Just, that's, that's what we use. Um, it is my dream to customize our theme more than we already have. Taylor, I know you've done some customization just to strip out elements of Ghost presupposes a lot of stuff about your goals and then builds in little features and widgets to help you achieve those. And we didn't want a lot of that stuff on our particular newsletter. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it is interesting because, and I, I mentioned this in session one, but didn't really show it. And it's frankly a little out of scope of what I think we want to tackle in this workshop, but like you don't have to be uh, like, you really only have to be comfortable with HTML and CSS to mess around with ghost themes and you need some time yeah. <laughs> in that time. I mean, you gotta be willing to like dig through a bunch of files. Um, the, the, the cool thing about ghost themes is they are written in, in this format called handlebars, which I think they invented, but it's just HTML with a different file extension. Um, and then inside of it will be little tags that are kind of like mail merge like where it will okay. merge in other files or your post content. Um, but what that means is like, if you are um, comfortable with HTML and comfortable with maybe like the browser inspector, you can go find on your actual website, like, oh, I wanna change this part and just do a control F <laughs> through your theme <laughs> and find it and be like, yes, change it, um, okay. it basically. So um, it's, it's kind of cool. Um, and I guess if there's interest in that, I could demo that at some point, but um, I don't think many people are going to need that, frankly, um, in most cases, because um, you can do a lot that the, the ghost is really set up to be kind of simple to start with, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of things you can do by just simply hiding in CSS, just like you could do in WordPress, too. Like there is a way to do custom CSS in the dashboard without modifying your theme. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's pretty simple. And then what's nice is you can literally just, um, so like when I modify the theme, I, I literally just uploaded it as its own theme um, that I zipped up, right? So for me to continue messing with it was pretty simple or you could use like FTP. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, they're, they're quite simple. You do not have to be say like a node JS developer or a PHP developer in like the WordPress case mm -hmm. to, to do it. It's, you just have to be comfortable with HTML. So. Awesome. That just made me feel a lot better about my goal of figuring out how to design a ghost theme. We can definitely do that. And I would say maybe that would be a cool stream where I yeah. can kind of walk you through that. Probably again, probably not in this course i think it's out of the scope of that but i think maybe folks would be interested in it we could do that at some point 100 percent. yeah 
That would be awesome, actually. Um, do you have something you want to hit next? No, I'll keep going. All right. Um, cool. Do you want uh, to change a the theme here? Just uh, sure. Why that? not? Uh, let's. Uh, what do you think looks cool? Do you want to do bulletin? Do you want to do? Let's do bulletin. All right. Yeah, let's do not? bulletin. So, I mean, you click on it, you hit use, and it's going to. It's going to install a thing. Ooh, validation field is required. That's weird. All right, let's pick a different one. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I'm going to refresh my page too. Okay. Maybe there's something wrong with my... That's no good. I'm going to have to look at that and um, what's going on with the themes. And um, I'll put in Discord um, what's going on there. It's very possible that I've messed something up with my own uh, install here. So... Um, but uh, yeah, for some reason, okay. changing themes isn't working, but it's it's pretty straightforward. You should just be able to click use and then install and it will switch it over. So yeah, designed to be very intuitive. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, now that we are in Ghost, I'm maybe going to talk through sort of what my compilation, collation, curation process is. Uh, I keep switching different terms. Uh, but generally the way that it works is again, again, this is for us as a curation style newsletter. Um, what we do is throughout the month, people are putting different examples of their work into the, into our Slack channel. Um, and so we have RSS feeds for everybody's blogs that feed into the blogs channel. We have, uh, support documentation that our support team is putting together every month. Um, we have people just come in and say, hey, I found out about this cool thing. Have you heard about it? Um, and for all of that, we I put together a custom emoji. It's the paper airplane emoji. And I can maybe post a picture of it in Discord. Maybe we can add it to Discord. I don't know. Uh, but there's a custom paper airplane emoji. And it turns out that in Slack, you can search for messages that have been reacted to Didn't by you blog the emoji this? react. I did blog this because you told me about it and I went, cool, I'm going to forget that exists. Um, and, and so I post. actually, I, yeah, I have that blog post somewhere. Um, but so we can hit it with that paper airplane and then throughout the month, periodically, I can come back and search, hey, what's had that paper airplane applied to it? And then I can just grab the links to whatever's in there. Um, this is really great because it means that I don't, yep, there's my blog post. Uh, I don't have to be on alert all the time, making sure that every single time I see a link, I copy paste it and I put it somewhere. People don't have to uh, manual, they don't have to at me every time they see something, they can just put the paper airplane emoji on there. Um, and it also saves me a ton of work in that I can do this sort of periodically. I can say, all right, well, uh, it's Friday. I'm going to go back through the past week and see what new things have been hit with that paper airplane. As the impact to is so low too, right? Like, yeah. It's not like you're pulling up a, a separate document. Not that that would be the end of the world or anything, but to do it right in the place where for us, all our work is. Mm -hmm. happening really or at least visible um is pretty cool yeah yeah and it makes it really smooth for what i try and do just periodically throughout the month is we actually have an asana project um for the roundup where each month is its own section and each section of the newsletter is its own task um and taylor if you can pull up yeah so that's the uh, task for our blog posts. It's not assigned to anybody because we are all writing blog posts together, basically. But this is a collection of the blog posts that have been published so far in the month of October. Uh, the person who wrote it, the title, a link, a brief description, because having notes for myself helps later. You will note that I haven't finished that for everybody. I'm, I'm going to do that because it, it's the end of the month and I have to do that. Uh, I cannot emphasize enough, don't make yourself do all of this at the end of the month. Don't do it. Go back periodically and just do it. Do it. 
to do it a little bit at a time throughout the month. Don't do it all at once. It's not good. Don't do that. Um, I have that bolded and in all caps in my notes. Don't make yourself do all of this at the end of the month. It's not good. Uh, this is also going back to that thing of making sure that you're picking a manageable amount of time and a manageable amount of stuff that you want to be putting out. Because if you want to be doing a lot very frequently, that's going to be really rough. Um, but yeah, so I generally go through, I collect all of these things. This is the blog posts one. We also have one for staff picks. We also have one for our support documentation. Um, we have one for announcements, which doesn't actually have these links. It has just bullet points. As I hear about things, I say, oh, yeah, we probably need to tell people about that. Um, so announcements will have uh, new hires or we're hiring, uh, events that we're planning. Um, I try and feature events up to three months in the future. So for the October roundup that's coming out on the 31st, it'll feature November events. December events, and January events. Um, and I find that that's usually a pretty good lead time because if there's a November event and nobody hears about it until October 31st, people are a lot less likely to come to that than if they can plan on it like three months in advance. Uh, I do this, this is more for our flex courses and our workshops. For community chats, those have a consistent place. Those have a consistent sort of concept to them. So I don't block those out quite as far in advance, especially because we plan the community chats less far in advance than we do the flex courses and the workshops. Um, but so we have sections for all of those different things. Uh, and then once I have those, uh, I would just take all of that text and then I would copy paste it into a post on Ghost. Um, so if you can hop in, I think I have the draft of the Halloween uh, roundup already open. So yeah, uh, it looks pretty bare bones right now. I always add the images last. Um, and it, Taylor, if you scroll through, the top looks very clean and nice because that's the part that I've written. And then you can already start seeing there's parts where I just have big notes to myself that just say finish. It's not done here yet. Um, Collections of links. Uh, this section is totally done because we only had one item to go in the what's happening in Discord. If you scroll down a little bit further, I think I dropped, that's the staff picks section, not the blog posts, but it'll look pretty similar to uh, what you saw in Asana. This is the same thing, but from a different uh, section. Um, author, what it is, short description or where I can find more information. Um, this and is I what wanted to like. kind of mention too um, that uh, just because this will be some folks' first time getting into the post section. Yes. Um, so of course, back again on the dashboard, you can go to posts. Um, you can click the little plus button to make a new post. But um, you will see here, which is kind of cool, um, and you won't see this just yet because we haven't done mail setup. That's going to be next week, and um, you presumably have no one subscribed to your newsletter. <laughs> um, so you will see that there's a sends column. So you can see how many people were sent that particular thing. Um, and opens is something that we are still kind of messing around with. There's theoretically ways where you can pull in like uh, how many recipient people information. Yeah. yeah. Um, that will show you how you can do that in Mailgun. And there's theoretically ways to get that into Ghost too but um, we're not going to get there at the, at the moment. But when you do make a new post, um, the post editor is pretty clean and simple in Ghost. Um, there's a little sidebar over here. Where you can do things like set your URL. You can schedule a post to go out if you want to um, or set the, the publish date, I should say. Um, you do tags, set the privacy settings for it. You can manually do an excerpt, which is um, that will pull in uh, in like Google search results. It'll be what they show. If you don't put one mm -hmm. here, it's going to just use the first sentence or two, which is most of the time what you want. Mm -hmm. um, and there's other things. Um, Ghost has kind of like very built in uh, tools to look at like what does the I kind of like this, but I've never really needed it. But you can have it set like what is. If you the share Facebook this, Facebook embed going to look, look like. like, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so uh, WordPress does this, but it's harder to edit it if you want to change it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Ghost has this built in and there's just like a little thing right there to change it, which is kind of neat. Um, and then certain themes have the ability to like feature a post at the top, like pin it basically. So that's, yeah. that's a, that's going to be there regardless of if your theme supports it or not, by the way. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, that's it. Like there's that, that's all the settings <laughs> for there's a post and then you can preview things and you can obviously edit uh, your post. And then there's um, some things to know about editing the post, I would say. Um, yeah, there's a couple of things I want to hit, which are if you start a new paragraph, you actually maybe want to do it a little further up because otherwise it'll be behind our heads. Uh, so, yeah, um, you can hit that plus button. OK, that's better. Right. You can hit that plus button and that'll let you pick from a couple of different types of thing. Uh, so image markdown, HTML, uh, image galleries, dividers, stuff like that. Um, I use this most often when uh, embedding GIFs, uh, but you can do a lot of different formatting things, video, audio. And if you go far enough down, there are embeds for YouTube, uh, Twitter, CodePen, uh, NFTs. If you want to embed your NFT into a newsletter, uh, you can do that. I feel like that goes against the philosophy of NFTs, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, I don't really know how that works. Uh, we don't use uh, that very much. I'm going to give a hot take, um, and that's uh, the NFTs only philosophy is selling them. So that's it's true. Fine. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, but yeah, so that would be how you'd get um, in the same way that Word WordPress now has the block editor that can do a bunch of fancy different functions. This is pretty similar. Yeah, uh, it's definitely stripped down. Like it, it doesn't mm -hmm. have as many. And as we mentioned last time, there's no plugins for Ghost. Um, yeah. So you can't add to this. Um, uh, I mean, you could. There are integrations but, that you can do with Ghost, but we haven't tried any of them. Yeah, they, well, the, and the integrations are interesting that they, they call them integrations but they're mostly from the other side so it's typically yeah. like hey you can use this api there's some mm -hmm. exceptions mailgun is one uh mailgun is an exception there's just like built-in support but it's not something you like enable or disable or anything like that it's just their integrations page just say hey here are other tools and products that work with ghost okay basically. um so yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. It's really just like a homepage for them to say these are the things you can do, okay. <laughs> and 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 things we know about. But like the the um the post editor is, is what it is. You you don't really change it unless you go unless you're an open source developer and you want to fork it. This is what you get. Um, I will say I really do like the post editor in Ghost. It, it mm -hmm. kind of is extremely focused on making the editing. Uh, happen and there's no like really extraneous features i don't i don't typically find it frustrating to use so i, I find it pleasant to write in ghost i have run into things where it doesn't do one thing i want to do like i wanted to do like an image that had an alt tag of course but also a caption and i wanted the caption to be different and at least at one point in Ghost, I had to do that manually in HTML. So they that's the downside. That yeah, and I was going to say, I'm pretty sure they've revised that. That was years ago. But it is kind of the flip side is it is simple. But sometimes if you want to do something really fancy, you may have to just do it in HTML, okay. which is a little annoying. But I would say at this point, there's probably very few things, particularly for a newsletter, that you will ever need to do that way. And that is the one thing I can also mentioned too is in the context of a newsletter this simplicity benefits you because there's only certain things you can even do in an email inbox right mm -hmm. um and it is really cool to see how ghost does a really good job of taking what you write on this page and translating it to the web page right i very rarely are we surprised by the way something looks on the web page yeah and, and even more rarely are we ever surprised by the way something comes through in an email. And that is no small feat. Um, if you've ever had to do anything with like HTML-based emails, it's not I always know. very straightforward. Yeah. So, Yeah. Uh, there is one thing that about the editor that I... Once you know about it, it's like fine. It adds an extra step. Uh, if you don't know about it, it 
causes you lots of stress and it's bad, <laughs> which is um, if you open that menu with the metadata again, you can see that at the top, the post URL is set to a special spooky roundup, um, which is, you know, that's the title because this is the Halloween roundup. That's when it's going out. Uh, Taylor, if you hop back out to posts, uh, you will see the demo title here. There's no, no content in that. There's just the title. If you open that up and go to the metadata tab, you will see that the default post URL is always this the title. It is always the first title that you give a document. It doesn't change when you change the title. Uh, yeah. So even I, if it's not published yet, right? Even if it's not published yet. So I have written figure out the title later <laughs> uh, or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And we had to go back in, change the URL, and then I had Taylor coded a redirect to make sure that people who went to the old URL went to the right place. Uh, so he, that's. Oops. Yeah, and the reader, so the it's kind of the flip side of WordPress, right? WordPress assigns a URL if you haven't picked one, it assigns one when you publish a post. Yeah, Ghost assigns one when, when you, you create a post or yeah. a draft a post. Yeah, um, so that that is I've definitely done that before too. Luckily, redirects aren't too bad. Um, there is a it, it's a little bit weird, but basically there's a and I, we can show this. Um, there's a place in Ghost in settings. Um, I don't have to remember off the top of my head here, actually. Um, I think it's labs and then, yeah, and then redirects. So this okay. is, it's very different than WordPress, super weird, but it's at least not impossible to figure out. Basically, redirects are a file that mm. you download and edit. <laughs> so you will hit download and then open it up and open it in like a text editor and it will have a little thing like yeah. this and you basically just do here's where it was yeah. and here's where I wanted to go. You can see both of my my titles for the okay. roundup that I forgot to change. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, no no worries. Um so yeah, it, it's it's a little weird. And then what you do is you go back so you save, you know, you make your changes and you save it and you go back here and hit upload and you'll upload your file. Uh, mine's in my downloads folder, right? So anyway, that's how you do it. Very different uh, than WordPress, obviously. In fact, I'm not, I think I always use a plugin for WordPress called redirection um, to do this kind of thing in WordPress. Um, but uh, the, maybe there's a native way to do it in WordPress that I'm not aware I'm of. But not, I don't know about that. I don't think there is. Of course, you can, you can, and keeping in mind, the reason we wanted to do this is the email already went out, right? So we wanted to make sure that people would like, who are clicking on a link would end up in the new place. Just simply changing a URL is very easy to do. All you have to do is change it from that field as we showed yeah. before. Um, it's just in this particular case, we had maybe sent it to someone already or maybe the email was already out or something like that. So yep. um, just so you know, that's hand, that's e pretty easy to do, but you do kind of need to know where to look. Cause I will say the first time I need to do this and go, I was like, Oh man, like what do I do? Everything's um, terrible. <laughs> there are also the other hackier way to do it, but that totally works if you want to, is you could just make a new post, give it the URL you want to redirect from, put nothing in the post, and then use like a little HTML meta refresh tag. That's what I used to do when I ran Ghost in my blog because I didn't know about the redirects <laughs> functions. <laughs> so works just fine. <laughs> You might have to do a stream on how to make that work. Yeah, it's it's not too bad. Um, by meta refresh, I mean like if you if you uh, wow HTML meta refresh, it's this thing, right? It's just okay, like yeah. the HTML tag that says, "Hey, uh, refresh and go here." Oh, so yeah, that yeah. was that my post only had that in it. That was all the content <laughs> of the post. Um, that totally works, and honestly, is a pretty good solution. So. Um, I, you can do that too, but the redirects file thing is a little strange, but mm -hmm. I like it because it is kind of cool to have like one place to look at like all of your redirects. So yeah, sort of nice. Yeah. Um, as far as the editor goes, that covers a lot of what I wanted to talk about there. Um, I wanted to quickly touch on just while we're talking about comp compiling stuff, Talking about writing is a little bit weird because again, that ba that's based on the tone, that's based on what you want to accomplish. That is also going to be based on just 
your voice as a writer. So I can't, I don't know how to teach people to write, except maybe I could make a style guide to writing the roundup, but that's not really what this workshop is about. Uh, I need you to write a brand playbook for the roundup. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have documentation going. I can add another section. Um, but uh, in terms of putting it together, uh, you saw the Asana, you saw the big old list of stuff that I just copy pasted in. Uh, and then within a section, you think about the sections that you want. So for us, that was announcements. That was, uh, we added in case you missed it or what's happening in Discord, which is just, hey, sometimes we have impromptu events in Discord. Taylor will host streams. And those aren't really announced beforehand, but if you want to maybe hear about them, join our Discord. And if you want to watch what happened, there's a recording, it was a stream. Um, there's uh, the blog post section, of course, support documentation, and then staff picks are our main sections. Uh, and those are sort of organized in order of, we need people to look at the announcements. What you missed in Discord is usually pretty short and it's event related, and we want people to come to the events. Um, I'm fine with admitting that. It's nice when people sh show up to stuff. Um, blog posts and support documentation, we're trying to highlight our work. And then staff picks are fun, but they are not stuff that we are as invested in highlighting in showcasing. So those go at the end. Within the sections, I also end up thinking about how to organize stuff. Um, for announcements, there's a really pr pretty solid format, which is new hires, hiring, anything where we need people to send us stuff that always goes at the top um, because that's going to be the first thing that per people see. We need that to be the first thing that people see. Uh, then we go into announcements about events, uh, the flex courses and the workshops. Like I said, I try and do that for the next three months um, with the nearest to the furthest. Uh, so for the one coming out on Monday, that'll be uh, this and Hacks for Hybrid, which are the November stuff. Um, Hacks for Hybrid started first, so it gets to go first. Um, the December workshop, which will be uh, oh, yeah, there we go. The December flex course will be open media ecosystems. And that'll also run into January. And then in January, we're talking about OBS, which will flow into that. After those is the community chats, because again, those are events. We want people to come to the events. We're highlighting the events. I don't know what the November community chat is yet. So that's just marked as something I need to finish. Uh, the, I do the upcoming community chat, and then I do the most recent community chat, and that's all. And then we go into infrastructure updates. Um, and that's a really solid, oh, and then community feature is something that we're experimenting with. We had uh, Lansing Community College's uh, hiring thing in our community feature last month. There's something that I'm supposed to put in there that I don't remember what it is right now, but all of that stuff ends up going towards the end of announcements. Uh, every, What's happening in Discord, that doesn't need to be organized. There's usually one or two things there. Uh, the other sections are more sort of holistic. Um, I usually end up grouping those by topic because then you can do things like, uh, for example, I think it was in July, there was that EdTech angst conversation going around. And so I could do one or two paragraphs that were like, uh, Jim and yeah, that would have been, yeah, that would have been the July roundup, I think. Um, so if you scroll down recent blog posts, uh, that's some stuff from Jim. And then there's like two, th there's three different paragraphs on EdTech angst right there, um, agony. Uh, and so I can, I usually, I collect those things in the order that I find them. So usually that's publication order, but then I'll go back and I'll say, all right, well, these three are all in conversation with each other. So let's put them together. Uh, these two are on the same topic, so let's put them together. Um, and that also is sort of a little hack that means that I can condense things because I can say rather than writing one three-sentence paragraph about one post, I can write one three-sentence paragraph where each two of the sentences are each about one post. And so 
it makes things a little bit shorter and a little bit smoother. Um, I have to finagle it a little bit to make sure that everybody's getting their time in the sun. I really don't want it to be like, yeah, uh, Taylor and Jim all wrote about this. That's fine. Let's keep moving. That's not fun. I want to give a little bit of a showcase of what each of you said, what's going on, but the ability to group things does mean that I don't have to block out a paragraph each for every individual post, which helps because our blogging section gets really long. July was a really good example of that, which is why I did a lot of con uh, condensing in that one. We had a lot of blog posts come out in July. Uh, support documentation, that also gets grouped by topic. Um, support docs are not usually in conversation with each other in the same way. But for example, we've been focusing on WordPress multi-site documentation lately. And so I can say Amanda and Meredith and Gordon have all been working on WordPress multi-site documentation. From Amanda's, there's this, and it explains such, such, and such. And then Meredith wrote this, which is a great gra guide on how to do this. And then this is what Gordon wrote, and that talks about this. Um, and so that creates little units, um, which means that, for example, if someone is only here for the WordPress multi-site documentation and they go, okay, cool, that's what I want, I'm gonna ignore everything else. But it's all in one place so they can find it easily. Uh, yeah, so for example, we had, that is from our September one, uh, WordPress multi-site, Amanda and Meredith put out a couple of new documentation, uh, new, new guides. Um, uh, there's, I don't know who that's supposed to be in the GIF I got, but, so things are organized around that topic roughly. Um, so I generally treat Reclaim Cloud as a really big category that everything gets grouped together in, uh, unless there's something more granular that I can go with. But usually it'll be like, this is all the WordPress multi-site stuff. This is all the Reclaim Cloud stuff. This is, we had actually a couple, a month or two ago, we had one that was like how to manage your files in the file manager in cPanel and in uh, Reclaim Cloud's file manager setup. And so those got grouped together, even though they're across two systems because they're similar topics. It, I think this is the support documentation in particular is a really good example of, or maybe like a good time to kind of circle back that something will probably come up a few times, something that Jim has blogged about a few times, which is sort of like, why do we find this valuable at Reclaim? Like the roundup yeah. at all. And it's really multifaceted, I think, right? Like it's, it's a, um, obviously we hope that some people find it valuable, right? That they subscribe and they're like, cool, that's new stuff coming out of Reclaim. That's great. Obviously that's like the first thing, mm -hmm. but I think there's kind of subtler advantages that are maybe just as important in most ways, I think for us anyway. And that is, it really is a great way for us to mark the work and look yeah. back at the roundups and say like, this is what we did you know, um, and that's huge. I think support documentation is a really big part of that because we can look at like the pace of what are we updating and, and adding to. But then I think another one that's really important is obviously like for the support documentation case, if we're linking to a specific thing, sometimes someone will get that email and go, whoa, that is specifically something I was looking for. And that's really cool. But Obviously, that's going to be kind of niche, right? That's not going to happen all the time. It's not like we're sending this newsletter out to 10,000, 100,000 people, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess if that many people wanted to subscribe, like, cool. We'd have but, to upgrade uh, our mail down setup again. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I think we'd be good, actually. I think really? Just, uh, we would just be paying more. But yeah. Okay. Um, but um, at that point, that that's a pretty large volume newsletter. And so um, right now we our volume is small enough that it doesn't really probably even register um, in our mail gun stuff, but we do use mail gun for a bunch of the different things that reclaim anyway. Um, but, uh, but I think the other thing is just to show people who are reading this and go like, Hey, there's a lot of stuff in the knowledge base. It's being added to constantly. You should consider checking it out. Yeah. But like, and that is something that I think would be really valuable in a higher ed context too. That was something I in previous uh, positions had run into a lot. We we're like, Hey, we're doing this thing, but like, how do we direct people to it? You know, how do people know about it? And I honestly think a newsletter is not a bad way because it's 
um, you know, you don't have to like send an email to say all faculty every month being like, Hey, remember we have a knowledge base for this. Um, he's like, you can make it more fun than that. Right. You can yeah. say, Hey, we're adding to this. Here's some cool stuff that's going on and make it a more of a community feel rather than sending an email that says, don't forget to check the knowledge base every single month. Right. Obviously you wouldn't do that. Um, but it kind of serves that function, right? It, yeah. it does remind people about what things are available to them um, in a really important way that isn't, I think, just relevant for like a business like us, right? Like I think it's relevant for a lot of different contexts. So, Yeah, definitely. And I really like it basically for all the reasons that you're saying of it's really useful for just reminding people that there are resources out there that maybe they forget about sometimes. I think that's really probably my favorite part about the roundup is just mm -hmm. knowing that it is a way to help people connect with information that's going to be really probably pretty useful for them, even if they don't remember that it exists. Um, and now they do. And also, as you said, much more friendly and approachable than being like, please remember that we there's a place you can go to look stuff up. Please, please go look stuff up there. It's like, no, there's lots of stuff. It's a magical adventure where you can find lots of new things. And also maybe the question that you had will also be there. Um, yeah. Uh, we don't have a ton of time left. Uh, the main, the last bullet point that I had is just about publishing. Um, so I've gone through most of our process by now. Uh, by which I mean there's the collation, there's organizing it, writing it up, which I can't really teach in a one-hour workshop, uh, inserting GIFs and images. We use Giphy as our source of GIFs, uh, and we insert them using the image tools that Taylor showed you earlier in the editor. Um, proofreading and link checking is the moment when you would go and make sure that the permalink is what you want it to be and not something else. Uh, and also you send it to a couple of your colleagues and you say, hey, can you please check this over and make sure that it makes sense? Is there anything that needs to be revised? Uh, if there's an announcement that needs to be sent out and you have language for that, can you send that to me and I'll put it in? Um, the mailing list stuff is the last step before publication, but that's not something we're covering this week. That's going to be next week with Jim. Uh, and then the last steps for us are basically to hit publish and then put out a tweet that says, by the way, if you're not subscribed, but you do follow us on Twitter, this is published. Go check it out. There's actually another ghost article that sort of goes with the one that I was talking about earlier. Um, that's, uh, what is it called? It's like the complete checklist for, uh, it'll be in the week, uh, the weekly resources. Let me go find it. It's uh, the, it's a pre and pre-publishing and post-publishing guide for new writers, newsletter checklist. Uh, yes, that, exactly. Uh, and it's, I think, pretty useful as a reference point. I would not use it as like a, a tutorial um, because one, they're talking about their process. And two, we talked earlier about how Ghost makes some assumptions about what you want to accomplish with your newsletter. Uh, so the pre-publishing checklist is pretty standard. Uh, it's a little bit different depending on, you know, what your workflow is. Ours is similar, but not exactly the same. The post publishing checklist specifically uh, is assumes that you really want to grow your audience and possibly even monetize. We don't do that. The point of the roundup is not to grow the audience bigger and bigger. It's to get the information out to people that we already work with. So Again, keeping in mind your goals and what you want to accomplish is a lot more important than following the checklist that Ghost has put out for you. Um, making sure that what you want to be doing and what you are doing align with each other is better. We are running up so close to time. Is there anything else that I'm missing uh, that I need to, that you think we should hit? Are you doing no, any? I, I think that's good. Um, I do like this checklist. I mean, obviously. Um, you know, they're, they're writing this with the angle of like, maybe you have paid subscribers, right. Yeah. To your, to your newsletter. Um, but a lot of that stuff is 
good to at least look at or peer yeah. into, think about, right? Like the idea of draft a couple social media posts to promote it. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. that's probably a really good idea. Um, and also very, again, very translatable advice, right? Like yeah. even if you're not going to do that, like in our case, we do draft a social media post and, and send it out. In fact, it's usually two because we usually have one that's like, Roundup coming out today, like soon, and then mm-hmm. it comes out and they do it again, right? Um, the, uh, um, but I could see again if if you're on a college campus, I could see that taking many different forms, right? Like maybe you do social media, maybe you have some other place where you put it, right? Like uh, maybe a like a campus email spot or i don't know posters i don't know if you want to advertise a newsletter on posters but my my point is like it's something worth thinking about is like okay you do have to get people here as well yeah. what do you have available to you what tools do you have to promote this um regardless of if you're going to monetize it or not you probably want the right people to be reading it at the very least right so yeah. how do you get that in front of those people yeah, that's a really good point. And I didn't mean to be like, and also it doesn't matter how you get your audience ghost is just wrong. It's more that I get frustrated with. I think a lot of their stuff is written. Like it's very, very translatable. You're right. I do think that when you're reading ghost stuff, you do want to keep in the back of your mind that ghost has a really particular image of who their user base is. Oh yeah. And, and that's a hundred percent true. I've criticized them before. I think it, I like, I do not like that their tagline on their website is yep. turn your audience that's... into a business. It, I get it. I get it's it. A... What they're trying to be is like, Hey, you don't got to use Substack. They, they want to be Substack com- yeah. competition. You, you they're, they're saying, Hey, we're an open source version of of that platform. We're something that you can install and control and, and do all that. That's great. I love that. Um, so I get that angle on it, but, um, on the other hand, like it's, it's kind of a gross, uh, yeah. sounding thing when you know what they mean. I think it's not the intention yeah. isn't bad, but yeah, it, that, that is how they're doing it. And I think it's a smart move because they're a tiny relative to WordPress. They're an absolutely minuscule project, right? Mm-hmm. So they're latching on to one niche and saying, Hey, this is something we can focus on, do really well do better. I I think this does newsletters better than anything I've found just by the simple fact that it is focused on it, but it's still open source and it has enough ability to customize it and change it that you're not going to run out of capability with it, right? Like something like Substack where Exactly. You're going to use their couple themes and that's it, right? Like, (laughs) you know, and this is extendable. That's not, yeah, this is extendable. This is uh, something that you have control over uh, in a lot of different ways. So yeah, I, I get it. But, um, but, but yeah, that is a good point though, to keep that in mind that that is something that they're very focused on. Um, and a lot of their writings can be yeah in that direction. It's not bad advice. You just have to make sure you're reading it with a filter. <laughs> cool. Well, we've gone a little bit over time. Anything else you want to cover before we say goodbye to everybody? No, uh, much like the roundup, this got longer than I anticipated it being. That's how it goes. <laughs> yep. But it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. See you all next week. See you next week. Bye.